Hey everybody, welcome to your first home lecture on the history of psychology. We'll also be looking at some of the major perspectives in this lecture. We will begin where all great things begin with a definition. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. This is the modern definition that emerged probably around by about 1950 or so. Prior to this, psychology would have been the study of consciousness, and then it was the study of consciousness and maybe some overt behavior, then it was consciousness, overt behavior, and some unconscious behaviors, and it's kind of evolved, but eventually this is where we are today. A scientific study of behavior, that is overt behavior, visible behavior, behavior that you can see without having to ever ask the person why they thought, felt, acted, etc. You can see it, you can name it, you can express it and mental processes. Those are gonna be cognitions. So thoughts, problem solving, memory, it's gonna be emotion, it's going to be reaction to stressors. All of those things will be your mental processes. Bring the two together and you have a pretty holistic view of psychology. The big thing to recognize is that psychology is not common sense. Now it may explain things that we consider common sense, but that doesn't mean that the entire science is just based off of common sense or old sayings that just happen to hold true. It has to be empirically approached. What does that mean? Careful observations, scientifically based research. In other words, anything that is brought forward in psychology today, in the 2000s, even in the 90s, anything that's brought forward today has been researched and it's used scientific methodology, so it's valid. What you're looking at in this picture here off to the right, that was something called phrenology and phrenology was kind of popular back in the late 1800s. The idea was you would go to a phrenologist and they would feel around your skull, literally just kind of rub their fingers through your hair and wherever there were dips or bumps or whatever, they would then tell you about your personality. They would tell you who you were. That's not real. It has absolutely no basis. So when we talk about anything in this course, we're going to be talking about, or we're, we will be talking about things that have an empirical approach to them. Anytime we start talking about psychology, we have to talk about the parents of psychology, and that would be philosophy, and that would also be physiology. With the philosophical parent, we have to look at Plato and Aristotle, two of the most notable philosophers ever. Plato starts what we call kind of a nativist way of thinking, where Aristotle is more of an empiricist. A nativist is going to believe in the inborn, the innate, the inherited. And in modern terms, we would usually just say what got stuck or mixed in with your DNA. Aristotle is an empiricist. He would be somebody who would purely believe that the environment causes everything. Bad parenting causes uh, a traumatic event, causes uh, continual exposure to something causes. So he was an empiricist. He let, or believed that the environment rode upon the person. Plato? believe that you were born with things and you were just kind of going through a process of self-discovery. Now both of these ways of thinking, the nativist and the empiricist, continue to replicate themselves and refine themselves throughout psychology's history. Galen is kind of a footnote and you'll hear me use the term footnote every once in a while. All I'm saying with that is that these people, they're worth noting, it's worth you hearing their name, but you're not going to probably ever be tested on them on the AP exam. I certainly am not going to test you on them. So he was a Roman physician. He started trying to find the location of the mind. And that sounds like a ridiculous thing to us because we all sit there and believe that our brain is our mind, is our mind, is our brain. But when we think, when we feel, when we have emotions, sometimes it feels like it's resonating in our chest and not in our head. And if you've ever been in trouble and you had that feeling like your stomach was churning, you would wonder, you know, where do emotions really exist? And that's what he was trying to kind of start the dialogue on. Later in the 14th and through the 17th centuries, uh, the old philosophers kind of lose traction and we have new people coming up. And one that we would talk about would be Descartes. Descartes is also someone who kind of uh, subscribes to the nativist viewpoint. So he believed in dualism, that the mind and the body were in fact separate. He thought that there were threads, these things that controlled our behavior, and later we call them nerves, and that those threads could then cause behaviors without ever having to think about them. And we know now that nerves actually do cause our reflexes. Another historical figure, John Locke. Locke, you guys should hopefully remember from uh, either government or U.S. history, but he was an empiricist, and he had this term called tabula rasa, and that is a term you should know. It means blank slate. He felt that we were all blank slates and that our environment, everything that we know, is essentially imparted upon us through experience in our environment. 
So we're born with nothing, according to Locke, and it is through experience that we gain everything. This brings us up to the late 1800s. And in the late 1800s, we have Charles Darwin who talks about the origins of species. And while he's incredibly notable, he's definitely not the father of psychology, but he definitely influences an entire perspective in psychology. And he also allows us to take things like animal research and bring it back to a relationship to humans. Wilhelm Wundt, and I'm saying it with a V, was the father of psychology. He's German, that's not why, or that is why it's not Wilhelm, it's Wilhelm. So Wilhelm Wundt is the father of psychology. He was the one that created scientific psychology. He's the first person to really propose that psychology divorce itself from physiology, it divorce itself from philosophy, it becomes its own unique thing, but for it to have any merit, it needs to be empirical. It needed to be scientifically proven. It had to have some validity to it. And he does this through what he called the process of introspection. When Wundt wanted to turn psychology into its own science, he said, when you measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. In other words, if I can tell you how many seconds it takes for somebody to respond to a positive reinforcer. I, I know something about the strength of that reinforcer. But if I just guess that somebody likes something and that in itself should have meaning, I, I haven't really proven anything. When you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of meager and unsatisfactory kind. So the father of psychology makes scientific psychology what it is because he demanded that all of the other procedures that are used in biology and physics and every other science, that those start to apply to psychology. So the scientific method, creating hypotheses, giving your research up to peer evaluation, all of those things become necessary. He looked at the immediate experience. He was concerned about consciousness. So the original definition of psychology, the original, not the modern, but the original was the study of the conscious experience. And what he used to study this was introspection. There was no brain scans, there was nothing fancy that could be used, so he had to simply wait for people to respond or to react. And so he would do things like flash a light and have someone press a button that would record their response as to when they perceived the light flash. And he would want to know that within, you know, a millisecond. You know, how, how strong did the light source have to be and how quick would the reaction be to it? So he gathered quantitative data. He has the first formal laboratory in Leipzig, Germany, and he opens that in 1879. G. Stanley Hall is another notable founder of psychology. He was a student of Wundt and he establishes America's first research laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, research laboratory in specifically psychology. And that's in 1883. Now, Hall is also going to be famous for the first journal of psychology. And that is important because that is where other researchers, other psychologists can read research and they can replicate it. They can validate it. They can criticize it. It allows for a certain amount of validity to come to the science. And he was the driving force behind the establishment of the American Psychological Association. That's important because it is an association that essentially is the governing body of psychology. Structuralism is gonna be the first school or perspective or way of thinking in psychology. And you see the first word there, structure. You see the word structure in it. And what this did is it looked at the conscious experience and it said, what are the pieces that make up a conscious experience? The elements of it. Now, the best way for me to explain this to anybody is to sit there and say, if someone was trying to program artificial intelligence into a computer, they wouldn't ask what the purpose was, what the function was, but they'd be interested in how to actually set it up, how to make a structure for it. So structuralism looked at the elements, the code, the the components that made up what consciousness was for us, but it didn't ask what was a consciousness or what was its purpose. Edward Titchener is going to be a student of Wundt, and he brings this concept of structuralism to America.
Like any school or perspective, a new school or perspective often comes when people start to question or criticize it. So after structuralism, there's functionalism. And just like I told you with structuralism, the first part said structure. Well, this says function. So it really tells you what they're looking at. Instead of looking at what made the conscious experience, we have a new researcher come up and say, all right, it's not so important what it's made of. What's really important is what does it do for us? Why are we one of the only animals, if not the only animal, that questions its own existence? Why are we aware of things at a level that is much deeper and different than other animals? So instead of asking what builds it up, just what does it do? This is William James. He would be considered the father of American psychology. Now don't confuse him with Wundt. Wundt is the father of psychology, period. But James really makes psychology a structure or a thing to learn here in the United States. So he wants to know what function does having a conscious experience serve? And he feels that there has to be some kind of life preserving kind of function to it for us to have it. And so you can see a lot of influence from Darwin's theory of natural selection here. The idea of heritable characteristics or survival of the fittest or reproductive advantage. And James felt that for this to be something that we utilize, it had to have some advantage for us. It had to have a function. James is usually most notable for writing the first psychology textbook, which is just kind of lame if you ever read any of his history because the man was landmark. But what you guys need to know, first comprehensive psychology textbook. So comprehensive, it took him 12 years to write it, and it was somewhere around 14,000 pages. No, I did not misspeak. It took him forever to write it because he wasn't really sure what he should cancel out, what needed to be omitted. They asked him to write a second book, and he politely declined. But he was able to show that scientific psychology could challenge and often kind of overthrow old common sense. There was an old idea that your brain was like a muscle, and so if you wanted to memorize and get your memory stronger, you should just memorize more things like random lists of numbers and random names and et cetera, et cetera. And he found that that actually doesn't make your memory better. It will actually diminish certain kind of areas of your memory. So it was important to, again, look at this and realize that this is the start of an empirical way of approaching this information. He also felt that we had this thing called a stream of consciousness, that our conscious experience starts and it doesn't really feel like it stops. There's no pauses, there's no gaps. It seems like a kind of, almost like a video recording, just a continuous stream of information. He is the first person to bring attention to Sigmund Freud. Um, I will obviously have some pretty mixed feelings about this when you guys start to hear me talk about my feelings about Freud. Freud for his time made sense. Freud made psychology popular with the layperson. Freud was massively wrong in pretty much everything. So when we start talking about psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, the Oedipus complex, you will hear me say that while it is the foundation of his theory, Freud got only a handful of things correct, and anyone worth their weight in modern psychology will tell you that Freud is notoriously wrong. People who know nothing about psychology usually know Freud just because he's so weird. And so he's strange to talk about, and he talks about uncomfortable things, and the word sex gets used more than anyone should ever have to use it. And that's why people seem to really kind of gravitate towards Freud, especially during the Victorian era. This person is going to be a footnote, and sadly, because of the historical context, it's why she's a footnote. Mary Whitten Hawkins is worth researching, however, she doesn't really make the same contributions as some of the previous and some of the later uh, men. Um, what's notable about her is that she did open several laboratories for psychology. She was the first female president of the APA. She graduated having done all of the coursework successfully for a PhD from Harvard, but because it was the early 1900s, they offered her a doctorate from Radcliffe, which she refused on just principle alone. You will not get any questions on her, but she is worth noting. It's worth noting that there were women and minorities that were also active in the kind of start of psychology. Gestalt psychology is probably my favorite. Gestalt and behaviorism, I like them because they're really heavy into the science. So for Gestalt, 
and I know I'm, it sounds like I'm saying it weird, but it is Gestalt. Gestalt is a German word. It means the whole. Gestalt psychology looked at perceptual psychology. And this is fun because this is where we get to bring in things like illusions. An illusion is a construct that your brain makes to explain the world and it usually omits things that should be there. So you guys may have noticed that with like your blind spot. You have a blind spot in every or in each of your eyes, but your brain just ignores them. Um, and the crazy thing is, is if you find your blind spot on a piece of paper, your brain fills in the blind spot with the background color. So if you look at a, a black dot on a piece of paper and move it so your blind spot should basically lose that black dot. If the background color of the paper is blue, then the dot becomes blue. If the background paper color is white, the dot becomes white. Your brain knows to fill in the correct color, which is just crazy. Some of the notable people will be Wertheimer, Kohler, and Kafka. Lots of Germans. Um, Wertheimer studied visual illusions, ambiguous figures, things that our brains kind of make up. And we'll talk about ambiguous figures. Often many of you guys know like ink blots. They're a little different on how our brain is using them and what it all means. Um, look at insight learning. And then Kafka also looked at um, developmental theory and gestalt. Psychoanalysis is going to be the discipline that Freud creates. Now, late 1800s, early 1900s, we're in the Victorian era. There's a lot of sexual repression. Freud is going to be a Venetian physician, and we'll talk a lot about his history when we get to personality theory. The thing is, is that psychology has become a science in the academic world, but the rest of society really isn't all that familiar with it, nor are they really all that interested in it. No one's really too concerned about why we're conscious or what that does for us or how long it takes for us to notice the ticking of a watch. But Freud then brings up personality theory. He also talks about mental illness. And he brings in a lot of issues that we might have with our parents. Most of them are very, very wrong. So he looked at disturbances of the mind, personality, all of it. And he did a systematic method. Um called psychoanalysis. The crux of his entire theory is that we have so much of our personality and so much of what we think about that is locked in our unconscious. And I'm telling you right now, if you guys see a question and the word unconscious pops up, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a Freudian, neo-Freudian um, term, theory. Um, it has something to do with psychoanalytic or psychoanalysis. Unconscious does not really surface much anywhere else. So he talked about the fact that we have unconscious desires, unconscious frustrations, that part of our personality exists solely in our unconscious and motivates or pushes behaviors to the good or to the bad, that we take in things that stress us out and we bury them deep in our unconscious and we don't really truly understand how they impact us. The reality is, is that that's not true. So we'll get into Freud. He's also the guy who came up with the Oedipus complex. And if you don't know the story of Oedipus, it's a Greek tragedy about a guy who was, you know, prophesized to kill his father and wed his mother. And his parents so freaked out by this, leave him on an island to die. And he is then found instead by somebody else and raised by his enemies. And then he actually does attack his homeland and he kills his father in battle. And as the spoils of war, he takes his mother and then literally beds her. And Freud came up with this idea that maybe males also have an Oedipal complex where as young men, literally as children, that they may have secretly had sexual desires towards their mom and because they couldn't express them, it got pressed into their unconscious and then instead they started to identify with their dads. In other words, they started liking the same football team as dad liked because dad did that or if dad worked on cars, they became interested in cars. It's all really wrong. But if you can imagine, people found it intriguing. He did all of his research, and I'm going to use that in a loose way, through observing patients that were already suffering from something um, and from watching his children grow up. So he didn't have a very good sample population to study from, um, but he felt that all of these kind of disturbances, all of these problems, they came from problems that were existing at an unconscious level. And again, unconscious means that you personally are unaware of them. 
His psychoanalytic theory, also sometimes termed psychodynamic, explains all of these things by looking at unconscious determinants. And again, anything that you have no awareness of. Now, the beauty of Freud was that through his therapy, he could uncover all the things that you were unaware of, but you would be unaware of them because they were in your unconscious, and therefore you would have no accessibility to uncover them yourselves. So it was almost kind of like it was a self-tailored theory that he could almost prove anything. Now, his job wasn't to be kind of a shyster or to kind of pull one over. He really was trying to help people, and he truly believed in what he was doing. But looking at it with kind of a modern mindset, it just seems hokey and silly now. But just remember, you know, a hundred years or so ago, we used to also try to lower people's fevers by attaching leeches to them and having leeches suck their blood. So just because it was com or is comical to us now doesn't mean that it's necessarily someone being stupid or wrong historically. So you'll see me put in things like this about Freud just because it makes me laugh because he is just so out there. He's very controversial in psychology. Modern psychologists all agree that pretty much everything has been disproven. Um, but he does come up with one of the first comprehensive theories of personality. Some of his therapeutic methods, like actually talking about your problems or what we would later call catharsis, the actual venting of emotional or anger and aggression by either witnessing others or guess, getting it out of your system, he's actually correct on. Uh, some of his prominent fo our followers will be Carl Jung, Alf uh, Alfred Adler, and then um, Eric Erickson and a couple of others. So the Neo-Freudians come up with some pretty decent theory. They kind of move from Freud, um, but he really, he's the reason that psychology has become popular and most everyone has heard of Freud. Because of Freud, we end up with the behaviorist movement. John B. Watson, who is the theorist that you see pictured here, strongly, strongly opposed Freud's theory on the basis that you couldn't measure the unconscious, you couldn't see the unconscious, you couldn't prove that it even existed. And so he felt that all psychology should be restricted to the purely observable, the observable behavior. So again, in psychology, when we talk about behavior, we're talking about what you can see, what you can prove. I can prove that um, a picture of maybe a snake causes your blood pressure to rise by putting a blood pressure cuff on you. I can observe that. Now, I don't even have to ask you if you're afraid. You might not be, but I can say that inside you, there is an internal reaction causing your blood pressure to increase by looking at a picture of a snake. I can show the behavior. I would never ask why or at some deep level do you have a fear or a phobia of these things. None of that would come up. He felt that for psychology to still be considered scientific, it had to get away from the unobservable, from the unconscious. So John B. Watson is the founder of behaviorism. He wants to give up the idea of consciousness as subject matter entirely and look specifically at the scientific behaviors. Other notables will be B.F. Skinner. He's going to be the person that if you've ever watched um, The Dog Whisperer or Nanny 911 or Super Nanny or any of those shows and they show you how behavior modification charts work or how consistent praise works or um, how using a reinforcement will get an animal or a child to do A, B, C, or D. That's Skinner. He's all about showing a behavior can be modified by either adding a reinforcer and increasing the behavior or decreasing it by adding a punishment. And so he's m very much a behaviorist. Ivan Pavlov, many people know the idea of if you ring a bell, a dog will salivate. Well, that was Pavlov's experiment. He was not a psychologist, but his experiment with dogs and associative learning was then taken on by Watson and Watson does what's called the baby Albert experiment. And we'll talk more about all of those experiments probably in class when we get back. Other notable, Paul Broca we'll talk about, especially when we get to the brain. Uh, after doing postmortem autopsies, he actually located a structure in the left frontal hemisphere of the brain, in the actual left frontal lobe, that controls the motor movement for speech. 
We also will later talk about Wernicke, and Wernicke found a structure in the left temporal lobe that allows us to comprehend speech. The crazy thing about humans, we're really the only two animals that have those two areas. So our speech is unique, and we'll talk about how other animals have communication, but true language and speech really is reserved for humans. Ebbinghaus, we looked at that when we went really kind of quickly through the study section, but he used a systematic way of studying memory giving people to study a list and then asking them hours and hours later what they remembered. Beverly Inez Poser, she's going to be another footnote. Um, it's important to recognize that African Americans were very active in psychology as well. She was the first African American female to receive a PhD in psychology. But again, due to the historical time period, there's not much for us to kind of really delve into here in an uh, intro course. We're going to quickly go through the approaches. We'll go through these in more detail in class. So the approaches all are going to ask why organisms act, feel, behave, whatever the way that they do. Biological approach will come out around the 1950s, and that just has to do with the emergence of science. So this is going to look at brain surgeries. It's going to look at uh, different medications and things that interact with neurotransmitters. So literally looking at it from a medical if you want to, or really truly a biological approach. This is the underpinnings for neuroscience or neurology. Some of the notable people that we'll talk about are Roger Spurry and Michael Gazaniga, and they're notable for the split brain procedure. We will look at that procedure. We'll also look at things called hemispherectomies, and we'll look at um, psychopharmaceuticals. All of those are part of that biological approach. We talked really quickly already about the behavioral approach. And so again, you have your notables, some of the buzzwords, learning. Learning in psychology does not mean go home and study. Learning in psychology means associations between stimuli or associations between a behavior and a um, outcome from that behavior. That's learning. When you guys talk about learning in class, like I watched something and then I went home and I repeated it and then I remembered it, that's actually memory. So when we say learning, we're talking about classical conditioning, opera conditioning, observational learning, that's learning. Conditioning, rewards, punishments, observables, uh, I'm sorry, observers, model behavior, um, all of these things are going to come from the environment. None of it is internalized. None of it is asking the person what they think. It is all environmentally impacted. In other words, I can watch it. I can see it happen to you. I can see the response from it. Cognitive approach. Again, this is one of the ones that I really kind of like because it has to do with how we think, how we process, how we problem solve. Um, the cognitive approach will sometimes buddy up with the biological approach and start questioning things like Alzheimer's disease. Where's the neurological underpinning and how does it really express itself and how can we monitor it through different cognitive tests? So cognitive approach, this is going to look at how we take in information, whether it is studying or listening or just experiencing, how we acquire it how we store it, how we process it, how we problem solve, how we use logic, all of those things, that's going to be the cognitive approach. We'll look at Jean Piaget. He is going to be a cognitive developmental psychologist. He's going to look at the fact that children change in how they take on information as they grow. We'll look at Chomsky. He's going to be a linguist. He's going to look at what's called the critical period for language acquisition. Um, we could even put in Elizabeth Loftus. She's going to look at how we can actually take in a memory and over time, we will actually reconstruct that memory, and it may, in fact, become very different than the original event, but we'll remember it as we thought it originally happened. Humanistic approach, this is also the 1950s. They came about because they didn't like Freud and they did not like Watson. In fact, the humanists felt that comparing us to animals like the behaviorists would have, they would have used rats and pigeons and dogs to explain their theory, was no way related to humans, that we weren't pigeons, rats, or dogs, and so what you could say about those species, you could not then just tie into humans. But they also had a really big problem with Freud, and they didn't like the idea that he felt that we were bound by sexual desires and aggressive energies, and they felt that we were rational, that we were striving to be the best that we could be, that we had human, you know, we had this potential for human growth. And so, different from animals, essentially good, rational, that's going to be the humanistic approach. This is going to be one of the most philosophical of all the approach of the approaches. Uh, the notable people that you should remember are, call, are Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Maslow had the hierarchy of needs. Rogers is 
actually one of the landmark people when it comes to therapy um, and looking at things like uh, how your self-concept fuels how you approach things in your life. Psychodynamic is still Freud. If you see right there, also known as psychoanalytic. If you see psycho, think Freud. So psychodynamic, psychoanalytic, it's Freud. It's Jung, it's Adler, it's Eric Erickson. The buzzwords, unconscious motives. Um, and again, he's going to look at kind of things or events that happen to you in your childhood that get stored in your unconscious that then come out and change either your personality or possibly cause mental disorders. And we'll just go back over how wrong he was. Um, the social cultural approach. Um, this one we're not going to touch so much on. It's not that it's not important. It's similar to uh, social psychology, but a little bit different. So we are social animals. You have to look at people in their environment. A truly social cultural approach would look at multicultural. They would look at the global perspective versus kind of the white dominant perspective in uh, American society because of the population that is majority Caucasian. It would look at anthropological studies. But truly, when we look at social psych, we're going to look at Zimbardo and Ash and Milgram really not going to hit so much on kind of this global perspective, not because it's not relevant, it's just because we're going to look at American psychology. But humans are social animals, and so the environment that we live in, the society that we live in, does impact the way that we think, interact, and who we become. The evolutionary uh, approach I really like because it deals with kind of Darwinian ideas again reproductive success, survival of the fittest. Now, it's a newer psychology. It's from the 1980s, even though Darwin is 100 years ago. This looks at the human species, and it looks at the commonalities between us here in America and then the global population and what behaviors, what things that we do everywhere to survive. And if there is a common thread that exists everywhere, it has to be part of what it is to be human. So we'll look at some evolutionary um, and sociobiological kind of research when we get to genetics. It's a pretty cool kind of thing to look at that there is this kind of human connection to all humans. Clinical psychology, we're going to look at the subfields. Clinical psychology, if you're looking at a subfield, we're really kind of talking about occupations. This is going to be the people that are working in hospitals, mental hospitals, or even just regular hospitals in their psych ward. They're going to help with the diagnosis and treatment of severe mental illness, and then also providing therapy and treatment to those people. Counseling psychology is kind of almost like a step down. It's the difference between going to the hospital or going to just your physician. The counseling psychology, they're going to work with people who still have some mental illnesses, but they're not going to be at the same level of severity. So instead of dealing with someone with major depressive disorder, they're dealing with somebody who has some bouts of depression, but aren't such that they need to be hospitalized. Now, counseling psychologists also can be counselors. So they provide therapy. You may see them in family, marital, or career counseling, but not everyone that practices family or marital or career counseling is a psychologist. So counseling psychologists are coming from a psychological background. You can be a family counselor and you could be coming from a religious background. So they're not always the same. Just if you're ever looking for a counselor, double check and make sure that you are getting what you're hoping to get. School psychology, this is going to be psychologists that come into the school. They're usually shared within districts. So in Fauquier County, we may have like two or three actual school psychologists, but their job is to come in and test people to see if they have any cognitive, emotional, or social developmental issues. Um, if a child is suffering from autism or dyslexia or is truly gifted and far excels, you know, in comparison to their peers, and then they appropriately place and monitor them. So they come in often to test and evaluate children to make sure that they're placed in the right places. Industrial organizational psychology deals with human resources, um, business and industry. They're going to look at human resource departments. They're going to try to improve staff morale. That might be um, how a building is constructed like you guys had in your reading, or it might be uh, how best to motivate somebody. They're going to come in and they're going to work with the human factor in industries and organizations. Forensic psychology, sadly, is probably not what most of you guys think it is. Most of you guys are going to think it's criminal minds. 
If you're not familiar with that television show, it's the uh, profiling unit of the FBI and um, they get a jet and they get to go fly everywhere and pretend that they're the SWAT team and arrest serial killers who they like literally show the worst police tactics ever in doing. It's a great show. It's really entertaining. I loved watching it. Um, I loved watching it because for me it was so fantastic and I mean fantastic in the way that it was fantasy that it was really just pure fiction. A forensic psychologist is not going to necessarily only work for the behavioral analysis unit. In fact, on the behavioral analysis unit of the FBI's main job is to collect statistics. So a statistician is probably more likely to be part of that department than just a forensic psychologist. A forensic psychologist, however, is more likely to be found in your local um, police departments or your local um, court system. They're going to be there for evaluating custody decisions, which parent is the better parent for the child to go with. Competency hearings, is the person sane or not sane to stand trial? Insanity is a legal definition. So insane is a legal definition. It's not a psychology definition. They're going to look at whether or not someone should be paroled whether or not someone should have their right to be free taken away and they should be involuntarily committed. That would be your forensic psychologist. So it's psychology within the realm of the legal system. If you really had your heart set on criminal minds, um, it's we can talk about it. It's just not what they show you on TV. So as fun as this is, um, and as beautiful as these people are, the girl in the blue should have been arrested like a million times over for cyber crimes. Um, the genius who is afraid to fire his gun and shows the worst tactics would never be let out in the field because he would be a liability. Um, the super cool people who like run in first and go hands on with the bad guy and like throw tactics, throw tactics to the wind, all of them, the SWAT team's going in first, guys. And the fact that they can figure out where someone worked from like dental records or that there was this one triggering event in their childhood that they just had to piece together. It just doesn't work that way. It just, it's too perfect. It's too kind of just put together. It's not reality, which is why it's so much fun to watch, but it's not a real job. Last couple of things. Where do these professions usually exist? Well, most of them are clinical in psychology, as you can see, um, working in hospitals or in private practice. Counseling makes up the next, are the next chunk. Here's a nice little surprise. Industrial organizational, right around 5% working with those human resources in our school systems with our school psychologists. And even though this is a little dated, I think you're going to find that clinical neuropsychology is on the rise because we're actually kind of really excited about the things that we're learning as we delve deeper into the brain. Forensic psychology, 0.5, and that's because it's in the court system um, a little bit in the FBI, but really you would be working for a court system, not for the FBI. Experimental psychology, this is kind of a neat thing. This is usually at our universities because our universities hire professors and part of what they get by teaching there is access to labs and a student population that's willing to kind of participate and they get to run their experiments. So this is going to be when people are trying to advance the knowledge in psychology through experimentation and often at universities. So sensation, perception, learning, conditioning, sleep studies, all of those things, that's experimental psychology. The National Institute of Mental Health also does a lot of experimental psychology. Social psychology, this is going to look at prejudices, stereotypes, group behavior. This is looking at that kind of group pressure on the individual and how the individual responds to it. And we kind of talked about that before. So really just how you live in your environment and what the environment does to you as an individual. Developmental psychology looks at human development across the lifespan from early childhood into um, the kind of golden years of your life. The interesting thing is, is that today, if we're looking at developmental psychology, the need is for people who want to study the geriatric because we have a population that is being born today that has a greater chance of living to the age of 100 than any generation previous. And so we need to know what it is to be elderly here in our 
kind of environment. What happens when you're 80 and your loved ones have died? Or um, what happens to your self-esteem when people start to treat you as if you don't have a voice or you're not as um, sharp or competent as you were before? What do we do with disorders like Alzheimer's disease or things like dementia that are ill-defined and kind of people don't know how to deal with them? So that's where a lot of the focus is nowadays when we look at developmental psychology, more towards the elderly and less from the infancy. Psychometric psychology has everything to do with measurements. So if you like writing tests and giving them to people and then seeing if they are good, reliable, valid tests, you would like psychometric psychology. For the test, to remember psychometric, just see the word metric, meters, measurement. This is the measurement of psychology. How would you measure it? Through testing. Sports psychology is the last one that we're going to talk about. Sports psychology is actually pretty cool. This is often used more often in like rehabilitation places as opposed to, um, you know, top sports teams. There are plenty of people that are sports psychologists that work with athletes, but usually it's when they're rehabbing or they're in a slump or they're having a mental block. But if you are interested in sports psychology, you might work in some place like Blue Ridge Orthopedics and help people who have injuries that just need to get back to normal daily functioning. So you'll see sports psychologists with university teams, with pro teams, but also with people who are just rehabbing. Last slide to leave you guys with. So employment, 28% college and universities. Remember, this is where a lot of that experimental is going on. You'll also have some counseling psychology there. Private practice, that's going to be around the 34%. Again, that's a lot of counseling psychology, but some clinical as well. Um, that 19% hospital and clinics, those are your clinical psychologists, but they may also kind of flow into that orange area. Government and businesses, you got six. That's IO, that's a forensic psychology. 4% um, in the elementary and secondary schools, those are your school or your educational psychologists. And they are slightly different educational psychology if you look in your textbook, is different than school psychology. I would encourage you guys to look those two terms up because I'm not going to tell you which one I test you on. And then the last one is the other, and that just means that there are a lot of other ways to be employed in psychology um, other than just what I could run you guys through here in this lecture. So this is it. I um, uh, hope you guys got what you could from this. If you need to listen to it a couple more times, I'm so sorry. I tried to keep it short, but we will cover the stuff again in class. So make sure you have a general idea of who the major theorists are, the different perspectives, the different jobs that you have, and we will straighten everything out when I see you guys next.